but she is here to help us extend her knowledge as an HLC peer reviewer and assessment guru when it comes to developing benchmark assignments and um, continuing to build the assessment culture that we've been working on for a while. Well, thank you guys for inviting me. I appreciate it. I'll try to remember occasionally in this direction so y'all don't feel ignored over there. Um, I have a long connection actually to doing some of this work in Kansas because I did it for several years at Benedictine College and that's where I, I really started my assessment journey when, when I was at Benedictine College. Uh, in fact, the very first presentation I ever did on assessment was how to do assessment on a shoestring at Benedictine College. So, uh, but thank you for coming uh, today and let me spend some time with you. I'm really encouraged by some of the work I've seen that you've done already. Uh, Aaron's been sharing with me some of the activities that y'all have been participating in. And I wanted to start out by telling you that this is not you. Uh, <laughs> you all are doing, uh, you're on the right road, you're not ready to head off a cliff, you're making great strides, structural wise, infrastructure wise, you're going down the right direction. Um, and the other thing I want to tell you though is that it is a journey and it is going to take time and this is not going to be perfect and it's never going to be perfect and it's going to be messy and there's going to be lots of iterations, that's the very nature of assessment. Um, unlike what some of our external parties think, this is not a clean process. Uh, you don't design a perfect assessment and give it and find out immediately what your students need and choose that thing. So that's uh, one thing that you need to keep in mind is this is going to be a long process. And let's talk for just a second. Uh, I've read through some of your materials and looked at uh, what you've created uh, up to now. And the first thing I want to talk about is that within the profession of assessment, you'll see two main philosophies. And uh, your philosophy has definitely fallen on one side of this debate. Uh, there are some out there that want to prove student learning. We're giving you money, we're sending you our students. You need to prove to us that students are learning. The problem with that is the focus is on those external audiences. It's on the legislature, it's on specialized accreditors, it's with HLC or somebody else. Uh, faculty have very little influence. If you're trying to prove something, faculty, it's usually those nationally standardized tests, it's big things, it's ETS major field exams, those kind of things, so faculty don't have much influence. It's actually hard to tie the results of those kinds of activities to what happened in your classroom because they weren't there. Okay, so that's difficult. And it's really about accountability. Those kind of initiatives, those kind of assessment systems are all about accountability. On the other side is improving student learning, okay? And when you talk about improving student learning, the focus is on your program or your discipline. It's all wholly focused there. Faculty are actually driving the assessment and understanding their results. It's all about you. Uh, we're here to help. Um, I always tell my faculty, uh, I'm here to give you every assistance you need, but you're the content experts. So this is all about you. Uh, the results are actually based on what happened in your classroom and your program. So it's not about some nationally standardized area that you haven't had any input on. And it's all about for the purpose of improving student learning in your classroom, in your program. Okay. So I was happy to see when I looked at what you guys came up with for a definition, because it aligns very nicely with what the very best minds in assessment are saying. So Paloma and Banta. Uh, Banta is kind of like, I call her the grandmother or the godmother of assessment. Um, First time I ever saw her at an assessment co conference, she looked a lot like Donna Reed. She had the hair, and the pearls, the dress. Uh, but she's written extensively on assessment. And she says assessment is linked to the decision making about the curriculum. And who owns the curriculum? You guys do. You own the curriculum. The faculty own the curriculum. Uh, Swain, who is the, for many years, the executive director of the Association of Institutional Researchers, says it measures real life gaps in desired skills and performance. So what you're looking for is where do we expect our students to be and where are they? That's what assessment does. And finally, again, Paloma and Banta say it leads to reflection and action very specifically by faculty. This is not an administrative function. Now, I will give you full credit if you say, well, Sherry, I've seen lots of examples where it's all about administration. Those are really bad examples. <laughs> Don't follow them. They're bad models. Really, it's all about the faculty. It always should be based on the faculty. Even the interpretation of results, which we'll talk about briefly today, because you're not there yet, but we'll touch on it. Even that should be dealt with by faculty. 
So I read what you guys wrote. I looked to see what you were thinking about as you thought about assessment. And so you said that assessment is ongoing, it means it doesn't stop, but it's systematic, and it's a collection of data and analysis of that data. Okay? Uh, historically, colleges have stopped right there. They've said, oh, look, we have assessment data. Oh, isn't that lovely? We have collected so much data. We haven't done anything with it, but we've collected it. But you went on to say that you're going to use that to document student learning, and that you're going to use it also to measure expected educational achievements, which inform decisions that lead to the improvement of teaching, learning, and student success. So you're on the right road for using assessment activities in the right ways. It's all about improving your curriculum. It's all about improving what happens in your classroom, in your programs. It's all about students. It's improving student learning. I'll tell you what it's not about, and this is a battle that we had at my campus, it's not about evaluating faculty. Assessment of student data is never about evaluating the faculty. And it's never ever about a single student performance. You love these students. You see them all the time. Maybe they grew up two doors down from you. And you sometimes can get very focused on a single student and how they're doing. And that's great. That's what makes you a great teacher. But when we start talking about assessment, we're talking about trends of data. Okay, so we're talking about cohorts of students. And so it's never about a single student. So keep that in mind as we start talking a little bit later about data. So how do you get to this point of improving student learning? Um, it really does start with the idea of asking the right question. And I don't know if you've thought about that yet. I brought an activity that we're gonna look, I'm going to pass out to you and talk about a little bit that I want you to be able to take back to your areas and think about and work with as you start thinking about your benchmark assessment. Okay? So I love this, this idea here. I call it the assessment trail. This is how assessment usually has worked in the past. You know, we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna do assessment. HLC says we have to do assessment. We're gonna do, we're gonna do assessment. Okay, I think we're gonna do all the, I, that's not gonna work, right? Let's let's try this instead. No, I well no really we should be collecting artifacts, but maybe we don't want to collect artifacts. It's just this meandering idea and come out further back than when you started the discussion on assessment. A lot of schools have used that methodology in tackling assessment. And really, it is this cyclical thing. And it starts out with asking the questions, what do you want your students to learn? So you all have been working on that. You've been working on the idea of some of those programmatic goals and those course objectives. So what do you want them to learn? Then you're asking the question, how well are they learning it? You teach it. Teaching is separate from learning. You teach it, but are they learning it? What evidence do you have? What evidence do you have of that learning? And then, what are you doing with it? What are you doing with that evidence? I use this a lot. If you go to my campus, if you talk to any of my faculty members, look at our blog site, all that stuff, I use this visual a lot because assessment is ongoing. It's always coming back. It's that infinity. <laughs> I've had faculty say, Sherry, am I done yet? You're never done. It just keeps going. Okay? And, but it always starts with a question. And the reason I think that's important is it will help you determine what is that benchmark assessment that you should be looking at for your program, okay? It goes to a plan. How am I going to plan to assess that? Where in the curriculum do I teach it? Is this a fall class? Is this a spring class? Uh, is this the second class in a sequence of classes? Um, you know, when am I going to assess this? When are the students going to encounter it? When I assess this, is this the first time they've heard about it? Or are we reinforcing something that they've already learned? so I have a higher expectation. Or, if they've reached the point, especially with my CTE programs, where are my career technical program folks? Most okay. of them are on the screen. Okay. And there's a couple in the so screen too. So, career technical folks, for you all, when you start thinking about where you're going to plan, there are points toward the end of your curriculum when you should be expecting mastery of things. You know, when you first introduce something to students, they're just learning. Then you reinforce it, you should be expecting a better performance. And then at the end of your programs, because you're going to launch them into the world, have fun. Uh, you're expecting mastery of those skills. Okay? So you're going to have to think about how you're going to collect that. Is this a test? Is this a performance? Are you observing them doing something and capturing that information? Uh, is this a written paper, et cetera? So you're going to find out, decide how you're going to collect that information. How are you going to score it? 
is this dichotomous? They got it 100% right or they got it 100% wrong? Or is it somewhere along the scale? They got this part, this part sucks. They did okay on this. You know, so how are you going to solve that? It's a smart board. You touch yeah. it. I touched it. Hold on. Well, let me back that puppy up. Don't touch it. But now I know. Now I know how to get it to go forward. Okay. <laughs> I won't touch it until I'm ready to go. Um, so, and then you're going to analyze and reflect, and that's really hard. Let me let me be honest. Some of this early part it takes work, but it's not the hardest part of assessment. The hardest part of assessment is what is it telling? You? How are you going to analyze the data that you're collecting? How is it going to inform the changes to your curriculum? What is it telling you? And then, because I'm an assessment director, <laughs> you're going to report it. <laughs> okay. I always tell my faculty that I'll be responsible, just like air be responsible. I'll be responsible for letting HLC or KBOR or anybody else know what we're doing if you just give me your information. I tell my faculty, you focus on improving student learning in your programs and in your classes, and I'll worry about the accountability piece. You, you're learning, I'm accountability, and you should do the same. All right, and then you start all over again. Does it work? Yeah. Oh, okay, there we go. Well, well, the wrong way. You went the wrong way. Ah, that is the coolest thing ever. Okay, so what does... We're all in all that it's working right now. I think. <laughs> 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 I'm, I'm, I'm holding my mouth just right and standing on my favorite shoe. Yeah. Um, so what does the right question look like? Okay. So I know that you all are working on this idea of a, a benchmark assessment in, in your areas um, that you're going to start with. So this is where you need to start thinking before you decide what that is. Okay. First of all, it needs to be meaningful. It's something that once you know this, it will have an impact on your teaching and on your program and on your course. It's going to impact how you do things. So um, I've had faculty say, well, I don't want to know their, their SES. Why? <laughs> you, you can't change that. <laughs> you know, where they come from. You, you're an open access community college. Always keep that in mind. Um, so that will help you. So make it meaningful to your program. What is it you want to know? It's meaningful to you. Make it measurable. Don't, I had a faculty member, I want to understand their attitude. So do their parents. Uh, that's not going to happen. Okay? Pick something that you can observe, something you can measure. So it needs to be measurable, either through the assignment that you're doing, or you're observing them doing a skill, CTE. Uh, my automotive guys, we put together a fairly complex rubric for them to use in certain kinds of aspects of an automotive program, uh, those kind of things. And then, this is really important to me. I want you to make sure that this stays manageable. Several big mistakes that a lot of places make is they try and do everything at once. They also throw in 15 dozen variables because they think they're a research scientist and they go, okay, well, I need to know their gender, or I need to know which high school they came from, I need to know their ACT scores, I need to know, I need to know, I need to know. No, you don't. Uh, because this is not about influencing the national discussion on assessment. This is about influencing your classroom and your program. Don't, don't collect variables that you can't change. Always remember, I tell my folks too, we are an open access community college. You are an open access community college. You're not going to affect any of those things. Think about your classroom. So collect the data that you need. In this case, I focus on the actual performance, the actual skill that you're looking for. To keep it very narrow. Keep it narrow. Don't be broad. Keep it narrow. Okay. So that will help you with the manageability part. You're not collecting. I, when I started at Johnson County Community College, um, I had a lovely lady. She was in our dental hygiene program. They gave her an award the very first year I arrived. And she was doing a project that collected 45 variables on every student. I wouldn't have given her a reward. I would have given her a retirement. I mean, she must have been exhausted. I mean, that is just so much stuff. Uh, it, it wasn't useful. They weren't able to actually use it to inform the curriculum. So keep that manageable. It's really important. Oh, I can touch it in the trial. Ah. <coughs> it's all in the touch. Okay, so let's talk about the tools of the trade. Now, you all know all these, and I'm hoping what you're doing right now as you're thinking about that benchmark performance is you're looking to use something that you're already doing in the classroom. Maybe you can modify something that exists. You won't know that can't choose that until you've decided what that question is. You've got to go back to the question first. Um, 
my science folks in the science departments, they love pre-post. Uh, they're always choosing pre-post things, and our office helps with that. But the thing I'll pose to my folks that love pre-post is, um, can you have an expectation that these students are going to know something walking in the door? There's a good chance, no, if we're honest. In which case, you're collecting data that won't do you any good. So just focus on the post. I'm all about manageability. So don't make it more complex than it needs to be. Now, if there's a reason you need that pre-data, that that's going to help you in some way, go for it. But by and large, go for your post. Okay. Uh, embedded test questions. This can be anywhere. We have a tendency to think about test questions as that you know end of the semester or final exam kind of thing. This can be embedded in a homework assignment. This can be embedded in quizzes. This can be embedded anywhere you like. My rule of thumb, my office jokes, I have about 15 thumbs. My rule of thumb is that uh, you shouldn't do an assessment before midterm. Why? Because you're actually assessing what they might have known when they walked in the door, A, or B, they haven't had time to really integrate it into the learning. So think about midterm and later if you want to get strong assessment results. Uh, Project-based assessments, you know, especially in my CTE programs, a lot of them do project-based assessments because they have an entire semester to build something or create something or tear something down and build it back up for those kind of things. So those project-based assessments, uh, you can prepare a type of rubric with a matrix, see what goes well, see what goes what doesn't go well. Portfolios, um, I do have several programs. They have a tendency to be in the humanities that are using portfolios. Uh, also, my graphic design folks are using portfolios. The thing with a portfolio is there's two steps to this. The first is you have to decide what you're telling the students. So you have to have a rubric for the students so they know what's going into that portfolio. The second part of this that we often overlook is we have to have a rubric for the faculty. How are you evaluating that portfolio? We don't always have both. Okay? So the portfolios are one. Surveys are actually an indirect assessment because they're really what? Someone's opinion. They're a student's opinion. So you can use surveys as long as you acknowledge to yourself what you're getting, which is not so much knowledge of how a student's doing, but their opinion of how they're doing. And they have a very high opinion of themselves. <laughs> and they think they're doing just fine. But sometimes surveys, especially, the um, example I'll use, if you're doing, if you incorporate some, maybe some service learning, that's a great place for surveys. So you take them out, they're doing some kind of a food bank. Um, you know, they're doing some kind of activity, uh, clean up trash, whatever activities you have them do, we, we do all of the above. Uh, then maybe a survey would be a good instrument to use. You can also use it, if you're going to a site, you can use it with the folks at the site, a survey, how did our students do when they were here? Um, so, so surveys um, and performances. You know, we have a theater program, and they use a rubric to evaluate performances, our speech. Uh, we have a speech communications requirement, and they use a rubric to evaluate the speech. So those are performances of the students. Um, so the things that you should begin talking about as a faculty in your different areas are, um, how are you going to start collecting the data? Once you decide on what's this assessment instrument that you're going to use based on your what? Question. question. Good job. Okay, based on your question, what is this that you're going to be using? Who's going to collect it? How are you going to collect it? Is it going to be a central repository? The thing, why I think this is important and important not to overlook, I mentioned before, this is about trends. So you're going to need two, three, four semesters of data before you begin to see those trends emerge. So you need to have decided in advance, well, we need to keep capturing this. We need to remember where we put the last semesters. Okay? Uh, also, when you're collecting the data, I recommend put in there, I have, so the way we do it, the way I do it, part of my faculty, we have one page that is just the data, the raw data that came in. The second tab, if I'm going to sort my data or make charts or whatever, that's a second tab, so that I always have the raw data, because nothing like Excel can make you screw up data <laughs> and pull out your hair and go greater. I have full examples here. Uh, but you want to make sure you keep that raw data in one place. The next, you can make a copy of that for looking at and analyzing the data. I also have a third tab, and in that third tab, I put any anomalies that happened that semester. You know, like, like what? 
Like a snowstorm that closed the school for three days and made me truncate my lessons. Like a faculty member uh, in our psychology department that had a heart attack and had to bring in an adjunct. That is information that could impact that assessment. And since you're looking at trend data, when you ask me two years from now why that semester looks different, I don't remember. But if I've captured it, uh, also a lot of times what we'll do is also capture what was the assessment instrument. We will put the questions in there or, or put the assignment that was in there so we know that information as well. So you will carry that forward. So you'll always have that data. You can put it in one place. You can uh, agree in advance. You know, this person in the department's gonna capture it. They're going to be the ones that are responsible for it. We're going to send all our stuff to them. Okay? So think about talk about that. Be sure you think it very seriously in what classes are we teaching this. You know, we we'll, we'll want to measure something. We want to agree upon something. Where are we teaching it? Is this an introduction? Because the most important thing that you're going to need to do is decide as a faculty, what's my expectation of their performance? And you should do that before you collect the first piece of data. Because otherwise, I guarantee, if you haven't decided your expectations for student performance, you will sink to the level of data. 60%? That's good. When really what you expected is 75%. Okay? Never, by the way, 100%. It's never going to happen. 100% of students never do anything. Okay? So think about those expectations. Think about how you're going to be responsible. Okay? Think about where you teach it. Is this an introductory? Time that they're so that expectation of performance is going to be lower than if it's time when you're reintroducing it to them, you're reinforcing what they learn. So, in that case, that expectation is going to be higher. And if you're to the point where this is, you get ready to send them out to work in the field, then this should be at a mastery level or what you consider mastery until you get on the job site. Okay? And so, think about when and where you're going to do that. Okay, so we're going to touch briefly, and I'm going to give you all some handouts. I'm going to wait till the end, because you're just like your students. And if I give you the handouts now, you'll start reading them. Okay? So look, some of what I'm going to give you will speak to this. Um, when you start looking at data, I'm sure Jeff would be happy to talk to you about it. Oh, absolutely. But I think faculty have to make sense of it. This is not something IR can do for you. Uh, my office is technically separate from IR, and we help faculty with a lot of the data. We do a lot of the processing of data, and then we sit down with them and help them interpret it. Because it was your classroom. Jeff's not going to be in your classroom. I'm not in your classroom. You are. So you have to be able to understand the data. And everybody does averages. Yay. Averages can hide a lot. You know, you can have some performances that are very high and very low, and the average looks pretty good. Okay? So you have to move beyond that. You have to think about the spread of the data. Okay? This is a pretty even spread of the data. Um, are they evenly distributed? Are there large gaps? Where do they exist? Um, and again, i put that up here again, you have to decide what is the acceptable level of performance. So you know whether or not they've achieved it. And actually, this is going to sound counterintuitive. You're looking for an area where your students are struggling. That's what you want to assess first. Because you're looking to do what? Improve student learning. So since you're looking for improvement, you want to focus on areas where they're currently struggling. So you can have some improvement levels. That's my favorite cartoon. I love Lucy and Linus. I went to a museum in California that's all Charles Schultz cartoons, originals, and stuff. Very average answer. Okay, so I got the data. I see possibly a trend in what do. What do I do now? Okay, as I say, follow the data trail. Just follow it. Okay, so what happens if you see the data leads to the students? They're doing pretty good, but this area here, they didn't understand that at all. That 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 sucked. What do you do? Okay, first of all, you look back to what was my expectation? What was the benchmark of the performance? Was I, what, how, I, how well was I expecting my students to do? Go back to the curriculum mapping. I know y'all have been doing some of that as well, some curriculum mapping. Where did this concept occur? Was I assessing at the introduction level? Was I assessing at the reinforcement level? Am I assessing at a point where, oh my gosh, I can't believe they don't know that? Okay, determine where you are in that. 
and go back to the to what you've been teaching. How is that concept taught? Uh, is it talking <coughs> head? I was right there. Uh, is it a talking head pedagogy? Do you need to do something different? Do you need to add more to you? What's your learning management system here? Uh, it's complicated. Okay. We have two versions of Moodle, and we're okay. only <laughs> changing by next fall. All right. Um, I'll <laughs> say Moodle at this point. Yeah. Do I uh, need to put something else into Moodle that will help them with some assignments, maybe some uh, videos or other kinds of activities that they would do? Um, where is the concept reinforced? So if I'm at the mastery level and students aren't getting there, this is the last course before I launch them out and I'm not happy with the skill level they're achieving, I need to look back at the curriculum and see where do we introduce it, where do we reinforce it, what are we doing here? And then ask yourself, what changes do I need to make to my curriculum to help students improve? It's, it's just that simple. That's the basics. You do that intuitively to a large extent anyway because you're constantly evaluating your curriculum. What assessment helps you think about is doing this more systematically in a way that looks at not a single class, because let's be honest, it could be just a weird class. Like, well, I don't, you know, where'd that group come from? I don't know. But it looks, at, it looks at the data systematically over multiple semesters, so you know if it's a trend. We've got a whole new generation of students coming in. This is that lovely G, Z generation. <laughs> They're a different ballgame. We had a Z panel. We do a, something called the Summer Teaching Institute. And we brought in a group of Z students um, to talk to the faculty that were there for this institute. And um, they're different. For one thing, they don't like the electronic books. Good for you. <laughs> they want actual hard copies of books rather than electronic books that everybody's pushing now. Uh, they're just different. And so we need to think about what in the curriculum. Uh, do we need to push more assignments to a, to a different kind of medium? Do we need to have more hands-on kind of activities that reinforce what we're teaching? All those kinds of things. And then, how will the program measure this curricular change? Which means you need to reassess. You can't just make a change and move on. Oh, okay, we fixed that one, let's go to something else. You don't know if you fixed it. You need to reassess. It doesn't have to be identical, but it needs to at least be parallel. So you can't one time do a rubric and the next time do pre-post test. You won't know the same information, so you need to do something at least parallel to what you've done before. And uh, my faculty are funny. I remember a, a call from the physics department, and they're like, Sherry, 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 my students hit the benchmark. I'm like, congratulations. Do it again. <laughs> okay? You need to make sure they're hit, that once you've made those curricular changes, <laughs> they're hitting it again. That this is a curricular change that has made a difference overall, and that you're able to you know, continue that. So keep that in mind. So the next assessment cycle, was there a difference? Did the performance improve? Maybe it's still not at the benchmark, but you saw some improvement. So that tells you you're on the right road, okay? Um, again, rules of thumb, make sure you've had enough time elapsed. So the bigger the change you make to the curriculum, um, we had a math department, statistics, uh, and students were struggling with peer area, math department got together and decided that the book they had chosen didn't cover the content in a way they thought was appropriate. They literally decided to change the textbook. That's a huge change. Okay, so I encouraged them, I said, do not assess this next semester. Maybe not even this next year. Because as faculty, what's happening? We are getting used to the new book. That's gonna have an impact on the students. Wait till you're comfortable if it's that big a curricular change. Now, if it's small stuff, I added some videos, I threw in an extra hands-on assignment, um, you know, I, I gave another half hour time in the classroom for questions, or I instituted, you know, those kind of things, assess the next term. But if it's a major change, I flip the classroom, don't assess the next week or the next semester, because you're getting used to a new pedagogy that is huge. And so you're not sure if you're assessing student performance or your own performance, and we don't want to do that, okay? So, uh, again, like I said before, make sure the measurement is parallel. It doesn't have to be identical because you've changed some things, but it should be parallel to what you've done before. Are we there yet? Okay. Um, I believe Aaron has encouraged you to focus on one thing this first go around. Okay. That's really important. Focus on one thing. Uh, eventually, though, you're going to be happy. <laughs> I'm sorry. 
this is a joke of my own back. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> as happy as you can be. Okay. Uh, at some point, you're going to be happy with the student performance. You'll be happy with that student performance. And so maybe it's time to move on to a new area. And a lot of times what happens is once you get a level of performance that you're happy with from the students, you'll see an area. It'll emerge in this process. You'll see another area you need to focus on. Okay, so if you think it's time, ask yourself, did I see improvement? So do my students go from um, accomplishing this in 60th percentile to 75th percentile? That hits my benchmark. They did it three semesters in a row. Curriculum's pretty stable. Okay, I think I'll move on. Uh, again, more than once. Did they hit the benchmark performance? More than once. Okay. Uh, are you satisfied? If you're not satisfied, even if they get your benchmark performance, maybe you really think it should be higher. If you're not satisfied, don't move on from the assessment. Uh, we had one in our chemistry department. Uh, students in the chemistry department, there is no sequencing, probably not for you guys either, there is no sequence between when you're taking certain math courses or when you're taking a chemistry course. You can do it all at once or not at all. And in the chemistry department, they were noticing their students were struggling with graphing. Uh, they weren't able to read them pro appropriately, all that kind of good stuff. And so they literally did a six-year project, six years, before they got happy with the results. They made changes to their uh, lab technician's book. They made changes in the curriculum. They made changes to how they taught it, et cetera. But it took them six years. Guess what? That is okay. I said before, assessment is messy and drawn out. And sometimes you can do something in three semesters and go, wow, that's awesome. But sometimes it takes six years, okay? So, and eventually, like I said, you may see a greater need or a greater question that emerges from the work that you're doing with your students. Who cares, okay? Um, there's a lot of people that pretend to care. Um, people that pay taxes, your legislature in Kansas, Kansas Board of Regents, the Higher Learning Commission, specialized accrediting agencies, people in Washington, D.C. that don't know us at all. Um, all these people pretend to care about assessment. Uh, they don't know anything, nor do they really care. They just want a number. <laughs> okay? The most important, the primary audience for this entire process is you, as the faculty. Assessment is a tool of the faculty, absolutely without question. It's a tool of the faculty. It's for you. So when you're writing those reports and you're analyzing data, if you're not focused on student learning, you've wasted your time, Aaron's time, Jeff's time, students' time, everybody's time, if it's not focused on student learning. Okay? And because you are the primary audience for this, I'm going back to this again. I'm looking at Jeff. Jeff. Uh, faculty have to be the ones engaged in making sense. Jeff's here to facilitate that, to help you with that, to help you with your data. Aaron's here to help you with that. You've got to do it. That is the biggest component of how you will finally understand and use assessment in a meaningful way in your classes and your program. You've got to do it. There's just no other way. Culture matters. Aaron and I had a brief conversation about this earlier today. Uh, culture matters. You need to value both your campus culture and history, um, there's no one right way, per se, to do assessment. Uh, there's lots of variations. Uh, you all are organizing some of your assessment practices around you know, humanities or social sciences. Um, we're such a large behemoth of a school that we actually do it by department. I know we are. I freely admit, <coughs> I had 18,000 students show up trying to park this week. Oh, this is bad. Um, but we do it by departments. English department has to do it, history, political science, et cetera. So there's different ways. You need to value your campus and value the history of how you've gone about assessment. Um, we have certain biases on our campus because of our history with assessment. Um, some of y'all, uh, Jeff, you may remember this, something called Jell-O that Jeff Seibert uh, foisted upon the world. Did I say that? I did. Okay. Um, it was called Joe Educational Learning Outcomes. And there are still schools in America doing that process, which is really bad, by the way. Uh, but because of that, our faculty had certain biases that we had to make sure we worked with and acknowledged and didn't voice it on them. You need to respect and empower people, and specifically what I mean there is the faculty. You need to be respected and empowered because you're the discipline expert, you're the content expert. You are the expert in assessment. 
Uh, you need the value assessment. If you had a president, I could tell them this. You could bring, or a board, I could bring, bring them in. You need the value <laughs> assessment by <laughs> providing appropriate resources and infrastructure. Uh, that's really important. Um, and as you think about resources and, and money and all those kinds of things and time committed to something, assessment's not a minor thing. It, it takes time. It takes your time. Uh, so any ways that, that the administration can help you with that, that's really important. And then you need to value risk taking, even if it fails. We have a little sign in my office that says failure is always an option. <laughs> and I have some great data I can share where the assessment uh, activity that they did was an utter fail. Um, my favorite one was in um, the uh, business division. It was a law class. And she had worked very hard to set an assessment, and we got the data in, and it did it. It was one of those that she, her expectations is the data would start here, and over the course of the semester, students would just improve their learning because of what she was teaching, and it, would, you know, and it came in just like this. You know, it was an utter fail. So we redesigned it, and that's going to happen, and that's okay because you will learn something from that utter failure. So it's okay. And as we think about culture, we think about assessment. These are all schools, and they all look very different. Just like your campus looks very different from my campus. It's very different from Benedictine. It's very different from Northwest. It's very different. Okay, so that's why it's important to make this work for you. There are some best practices, and what I've tried to share with you today is based on the idea of best practice. What do we know works? What do we know is important um, in terms of focusing on student learning. But you're gonna to have to personalize it to you all. It's gonna to have to be about what you think is important. Because whether you're this school or that school, I know more than anything, faculty want students to do well. You want faculty success. That's why you're teachers. That's why you're faculty. That's why you're here. And so assessment, just think of it as one more tool in your tool chest. Assessment will help you accomplish those goals. I gotta get one of these. Uh, so, I uh, want to give some time. Uh, we have uh, about 10 minutes or so uh, that we can open up for questions or I can answer questions on anything. And I'm also going to pass these out. Uh, we sent them electronically for those of you that aren't here. And what I'm, I'm just going to pass this back to everybody. Um, so, what I did, this is some material that I use with my own faculty that has been very successful. <laughs> He wants them all. <laughs> okay, go ahead. Okay. So what we have here, the very first page, for those of you who are the very first page is something to help you think through what is my question. As I'm trying to design this benchmark assessment, what is my question? Okay? What is it you want to know? So you work your way through. And let me tell you the most common problem that most faculty have in completing this is that their question is too broad. Make it narrow. You can't answer everything about a student. If you think about, you, most of you, I'm sure all of you, have been teaching for a long time in your discipline, in your area. So think about, based on your own understanding, what's an area my students seem to be struggling with? What is that skill? What is that foundational knowledge that I don't think they're getting at the level I want? Start with that kind of question for your discipline. Okay. So this is just a sheet to walk you through. On the back, I tell you to share it with some colleagues, see if they can help you narrow it down even further. Especially, this sounds funny, talk to somebody outside your discipline, because they'll say, well, I don't understand what that word means. And so narrow that down for me. Okay, so they can sometimes help you do that. The next one is just a sheet that talks about your data, as you start gathering your data. Okay, it gives you some basic ideas about be realistic, Okay. Prioritize what it is you're collecting. Be specific. Again, set those standards of what you expect from your students. If you've got multiple people collecting data, and this is really important, so if, if you're maybe there's three faculty or you've got two adjuncts also collecting data, my suggestion would be to establish a common template that you're putting the data into so that you won't swear when the data comes <coughs> into you in different ways. Okay? I've done that swearing for you in advance. Um, so establish a template everybody's putting it into so you have a common sh sheet that you can use. Um, it is important, I always say with data, you want to look at it in multiple ways. I always make two or three visualizations of my data. 
uh, charts that I can share with faculty because what does 4.2 mean? I don't know. If I put it in a table, if I put it in a chart where they see bars and they say, well, that one's a lot lower than all the rest, all the rest then it's easier to visualize what the data is telling you. But in doing that, and um, this is an area Jeff really can't help, but my office helps a lot, you have to make sure that the Excel isn't lying to you. <laughs> you know, because sometimes those, you know, grids get off and it looks really significant, but really it's just because you have the access wrong, <laughs> you know, and so you want to make sure that you're setting it up properly. But visualizing the data is really, really important. Um, you need to be able to accept the good, the bad, and we call it the good, the bad, and the ugly. Uh, and that's going to happen. And the first time you do an assessment, there's every indication that you won't get what you want. Okay? The tool won't be quite right. You'll need to tweak the tool. Uh, not everybody will have gathered it the way they were supposed to. Um, so there's going to be good data. There's going to be bad data. It's going to be really ugly data. So be, be ready for that. Uh, give you some advice on the kind of ways to look at your data in terms of averages, frequencies, and um, reporting out. And then the last one is one we use whenever we meet together with faculty. It's a, because we always draw charts, we always put charts up on the wall, um, this just is a way to walk them through the charts and say, okay, what do you, what's your first observation of the data? What do you notice? And I say, well, I noticed that question nine, nobody got that right. That kind of thing. So um, think about gaps, relationships. Where were the successes? Is there parts of your assessment data that was, students were very successful? What were the outliers? Sometimes an outlier is you got a bad question. So the example I give, political science had this big, super hairy pre-post test. Hated that thing. It was 19 <laughs> questions. And they did it not only at the college, but they did it at all their college now high schools. So we're talking thousands of data points. It was awful. <coughs> and there was one question that literally on the post test, students did the course. I'm like, this makes no sense, okay? It was political science, and it was a, um, maybe some of y'all will know this, marble cake federalism. <laughs> ah, we got one guy. I always went, I have no idea. Was it a George Washington recipe? I don't know. Uh, but it was about marble cake federalism, and they were doing terrible on this on the post test in this one area. And so I went back to the faculty, I got a copy of the original test, and I read it and I said, okay, I want to make sure I understand. You guys are teaching logic in this course. And they said, well, no, we don't teach logic. That's not you know, political science. <laughs> and um, I said, well, this is a logic-based question. The way they had it set up, A but not F, F, E, you know, that kind of thing. And they said, well, they should know that by now. If you're not teaching it, don't assess it. Okay? So sometimes it could be a bad question. And that often will show up as an outlier. So these are just some helpful sheets that we use on my own campus that might help you as you begin to do that process. Can I answer some other questions? We still have? I'm going to ask a question. Yeah. Hi, Sherry. My name is Larry Bissan. I teach my friends here. Uh-huh. After where you lecture here, I think my question would be, I just, this semester, I just took a few sections of beginning under my class in different settings. Setting means um, by the nature of the classroom, some of the classes are very directed because students can really move their chairs and tables so they can, can gather together. And some of the classes, they can help move their <coughs> chairs because they're heavy and they have four people and they go to So I they didn't Don't do an assessment that requires that skill or yeah. that that modality. So my, my question would be, uh, if you have a, a comprehensive final here, so can, I, can, can we use a uh, comprehensive final? Yes and no. Oh, that's yes and no. Yes and no. My math faculty use a comprehensive final as well uh, that's across all sections. However, for an assessment question, you're going to narrow it down to just a couple of questions in there. You're not using the entire test. You're looking more specifically at some category within that comprehensive that you want to see how the students are doing. So I'll let you use a comprehensive, but narrow down Specific. which ones you're pulling out and looking at. This is thank you. Okay. Yeah. So um, I teach public speaking, and I have five sections of public speaking, 20 students in each section. Do I take a representative sampling from each section, or do I do all of them? 100 students is, well, 
So I'm going to guess. This is a guess on my part. I would guess that you're probably going to use a rubric to evaluate a, a student giving a speech. Well, yes, I do. But I'm working with the English department as well. All the speech instructors are. We're, we're combining our efforts because we teach similar things. Right. And so that's one of the things we've talked about as our benchmark, coming up with that one thing that we both do. Hmm. You can do a sampling. 100 students is not that many for a sampling. You're going to have to gather more data over a longer time frame in order for it to be more meaningful to you. Um, see, well, my, in my institution, I, I would consider 100 a sample. Uh, we actually do 500 samples for the English department. Okay. So depending on what you finally decide, go back first. Go back first and decide what is that assessment question. Once you decide that, for you and English, decide what the assessment question is. It will help drive what is it you're going to do. And that will then drive, can you sample? Does that make sense? Yeah. So, um, yeah. Where's the value? Because we have traditional students and we have non traditional students. They right. obviously have different learning styles. Yep. How do you structure a question? Because I have I have very large issues with only focusing on pedagogy and not andragogy with our adult population. How do you define that sample so that when we're getting data, it's inaccurately representing adults if we're right. not teaching them? So how do you, I mean, is that going into the weeds too much? To no, that's not. If, if it's important to your program, what are you teaching? Uh, I teach Italian primarily. Okay. So you've got a, a mix of incoming freshman style students and you've got some adults that are re returning. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, again, I think if you back up the train, before you worry about that component, and it is important, don't, don't uh, and it certainly I find that a lot with my CTE programs, that's something we have to worry about. Uh, but you still have to back up the train far enough to know what is it you're trying to determine about your students. Um, because whether they are starting students fresh out of high school or they are students that are 28 and looking to re retool a career, there are foundational knowledge pieces that you think they need to have. And what you're trying to determine is are you teaching in such a way, are they learning in such a way, uh, is there a match between that, that they're gaining that foundational skill that they're all going to have to have. So could you add a perception component into that assessment? So you have your hard assessment and then add a perception outlier to the Absolutely. Determine? You can. You, just like you can do a qualitative assessment. Now, I'm going to be really blunt. It's a heck of a lot more work. <laughs> but you could absolutely do a qualitative type of assessment as well as a quantitative. And uh, that does mean picking your data apart a little bit more, which means you're going to have to bring in a variable dealing with age. Um, again, it makes it much more complex. If that's yeah, important to you, road, yeah. I, if I it's important to it. you, you can absolutely do it. Um, so it, it will not impact the fact that you're still asking a foundational question that everybody needs to have the skills at the end of what they're doing. Content based. Content. Uh, yep. And you know, in terms of what changes the class, that's again, wholly driven by you. Wholly driven by you. Anybody over there have any questions? I see one face anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody on the screen on Zoom that has questions? They're just hoping we don't notice them. They're being real quiet. There's a few people there. So. <laughs> no, I see a shaking head. We're all good. We have a very large attendance, actually. We just can't Great. see everybody. Can I answer anything else? Again, you know, what I would talk about is structure. You're the content expert. You need to think about what's important to you, but you also need to keep it manageable. I go back to, I did some qualitative research. It's painful. It's easy to get into, really hard to get out of. It yeah. is. It is. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. And you know, yeah. so I, I was also a Benedictine uh, for several years, and uh, they, in some respects, I think schools like that have it much easier. They have a captured audience from freshman to senior, they have the opportunity to measure over time and all this. We have an open access community college. They may drop into our class and disappear. They may be here for two years. It's a two year school, they may be here for six years. I mean, you know, we just have such a wider variety of 
types of students and types of need, needs that we are meeting as an institution. Um, that's why, in some respects, it's more important for us to focus on the classroom and focus on specifically what's happening in those classrooms and work to improve in those areas. We can't, programs are important, CTE, you guys are awesome, but um, for the transfer side of the house, we have to look at individual curriculum pieces. Uh, it's harder for us to put together a, a, something that would track our students over time because we saw how long we gonna be here. It's not the same as a four year. It's more challenging but more fun. <laughs> Any other questions I can answer? You guys have been so polite. Yeah. You've already had yours. If you don't use the same teaching method across the classroom, how do you do that system? Because if you're teaching style is different from another person teaching style, how do you do the assessment? How do you reconcile this thing? So, um, you, for one thing, this is going to sound harsh. For one thing, you have to put your ego to the side. And we actually had a group of faculty that um, they sent all their data to me, and I looked to see which one of the faculty uh, had the greatest gain in their student scores. And that faculty member did a symposium for the rest of the faculty in his area to say, this is how I teach it. So, but that, and, and, and I, you know, it is a touchy topic, right? Uh, so that's why my office served as that gatekeeper. Nobody else saw the results. Nobody saw who did the worst. Because <laughs> yeah, it's not about faculty. This is about student learning. So my office served as the gatekeeper. Um, and I, we were the ones that provided, looked at the data, provided the data. And then, but the faculty had to be willing to say, okay, well, he does it best. So tell us, how do you teach that concept? And be willing to share that information freely with each other. Um, again, if we're focused on student learning, then it's not about us. It's not about us. So. All right, well, our prize winners are actually all on the TV. Um, <laughs> we had, so sorry, it's like a little down in the room, but uh, we had 30 people in attendance today. So thank you all for coming, those of you that are remote and here. And um, 